Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Today is Tuesday, October 6th. We are thrilled to have an incredible panel today focused on vaccine development. Um, before we launch into that, I just thought we might take a brief moment to discuss some of the evolving uh, political situation. And I thought I might ask Ivan to pull up one slide for you from our last conversation on therapeutics. Obviously, we did not time this talk to um, coincide with the political events. However, they are what they are. And in many ways, we were really fortunate to have this conversation um, with our last panel of speakers last week, because I think this slide speaks to um, many of the questions that have come up in relation to the president. And so you can see here, again, this is just um, a reminder to all of us the spectrum of presentation of symptoms for COVID-19 from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic all the way through to critical illness. And I think this slide really captured a lot of information. Um, and again, I think this is around therapeutics, but I think it's important to think about all these processes. And in many ways, I think there will be um, a lot of interesting overlap in our discussion today with this incredible team. But I think just to briefly touch on, um, the president received three different types of medications. He received an antibody, um, a monoclonal uh, cocktail, um, an antiviral, and um, a steroid. And so in these situations, he was really given, um, as many people said, all three medications, um, which could indicate a certain severity of illness. And so I just wanted to briefly touch on that. I'm not going to dive into therapeutics today, since that's not the topic of today's conversation. And um, I'll just leave that there for those who want it. And you can, thanks, Yvonne, you can pull that down. Um, so I'm going to pass it over now to Alan to talk about um, framing out today's conversation. Thanks, Ingrid. I just wanted to say very quickly that as everyone in the class knows, vaccines have really been at the center of discussion since the onset of the pandemic. And one of our most hopeful areas of strategies that could really both mitigate and end the epidemic in some timely way. And today we have four guest faculty who are really experts in the area of vaccines and different aspects of them. One of the things that Ingrid and I said at the first class is that we would really be pursuing what we call biosocial, the integration of deep understanding of the biology, in this case of COVID-19, and the full range of social issues that it raises. And this is especially true of vaccines. On the one hand, they elicit our most meticulous and highly developed science, both in the laboratory and then translationally to humans. But the effectiveness and the safety of vaccines can only truly be understood in a deeply social and, as we're learning, a highly political um, context. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. We have a quick poll um, that Yvonne will put up now. Um, we were curious if you've gotten your seasonal flu vaccine yet. And this is highly relevant. It's not just a question like, have you done what you need to? All the students who are on campus and Massachusetts recently passed a law or a regulation requiring that all college students who are studying on a campus here um, get the seasonal flu vaccine. Um, but of course, this raises larger issues of who gets vaccines, are they mandated, what role they play in protecting ourselves as well as um, protecting others. So let's see what the poll results are. Um, I don't like to scold or be paternal in any way, but um, I urge you. And so there's a public health message in today's poll. Um, to make sure that in these next weeks, um, 
that you do get vaccinated. Um, it's always good public health practice to get vaccinated. But in this year where there will be COVID and there will be seasonal flu, um, our public health colleagues are really urging all of us to get the flu vaccine. So I realize it's early in the cycle to get it, but the sooner you get it, the better actually. So, so on that um, note, um, we'll go to our speakers. I just wanted to say before Ingrid introduces them that vaccines have always fascinated me as a historian of medicine because they go back so deeply in our history, at least to the 10th century, many areas of the world have contributed to vaccination, first inoculation, the recognition that people who become infected may develop a sustainable immunity to that disease in the future. And it's remarkable to me, and many of the people here, all of our guests have contributed to this. Um, I read this morning that we've done six years of conventional vaccine research on COVID in the last six months. So historians like me will be studying this phase intensely in the future. So I turn it back to you, Ingrid. So yes, thank you, Alan. I mean, this is really um, what we might say is the all-star team here. And we are so fortunate that they're all based in Boston. Um, this is a group where even if you were to say, I'm only going to bring in national speakers. These would still be the people I would choose. So we are so lucky that they're all affiliated with Harvard and I feel fortunate to know all of them through um, the HIV work that they've been connected to. So uh, kicking us off today will be Dr. Bruce Walker, who is the founding director of the Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT, and Harvard. And Dr. Walker really is a world leader in the study of immune control and evasion in HIV infection. Um, he was really one of the first to describe HIV specific CD8 T cells. Um, and he's really defined the role and fate of these cells in acute and chronic HIV infection and transmission. And he's just a giant in the field of HIV research. We're all so lucky to have him here. And he's going to be starting us off with really a, a high level understanding of vaccine development. Then we have Dr. Galit Alter, who is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and uh, a member of the Reagan as well. And her work really focuses on the development of systems biology tools to define the correlates of immunity against infectious diseases that really ravage the globe. And so she's going to be bringing that lens in today, both to speak about all of these different vaccine trials that are happening, but also this concept of systems biology, which I think is really a critical piece of this conversation. We'll be following um, with um, Dr. Lindsay Baden, who is the Director of Clinical Research in our Division of Infectious Diseases at the Brigham, as well as the Director of Infectious Diseases at the Farber. He's also an Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School, and he's really a leader right now in one of the biggest vaccine trials um, that's, that's happening in a very promising vaccine candidate through Moderna. And we'll be really excited to hear from him about, about that process. And then finally, Dr. Basola Ojikutu, who is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. She's also an infectious diseases trained physician at the Brigham. And her research has really traditionally focused on improving access for to HIV related care for women, underserved immigrants and minority populations in the United States. She's really playing a critical role right now in understanding human subjects and the importance that we will have as these vaccines roll out in, in terms of ensuring that we reach the most critical and vulnerable populations who are part of this pandemic right now. So again, four absolute visionary leaders, and we're so excited. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Walker to kick us off. Great, uh, thanks very much. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so uh, let me just start out by putting this in a little bit of perspective. Um, Alan already made uh, reference to how fast things are going, but this is just looking back at the HIV pandemic, which is really what got me involved in, in doing infectious diseases as a career and, and, and uh, research on HIV. Um, 
these were the sentinel cases of HIV. And you can see that it took a couple of years after these started appearing before there was even a report about them. And it took a number of years beyond that until we actually had a diagnostic test to be able to, to identify the EDR, you know, to identify people who were infected. Uh, compare that to the seeds of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And what you can see here is that the first report was, um, was already um, in December. Uh, three family members that were all infected uh, at, with, a, with a common link. Um, identification of the agent by early January and a diagnostic test uh, a couple of days later. So incredible speed and it's, a, it's really a tribute to scientific advances. In January, I was in South Africa teaching a course to Harvard and MIT undergraduates called Evolution of an Epidemic, um, where we were talking about HIV and sort of the, how, how, a, how the medical community understands a, how an epidemic develops, uh, how clues from patients guide scientific discovery, and uh, how policy and advocacy uh, influence things. Uh, two of the people on this trip, uh, coincidentally, one was a MIT student who had just returned from Wuhan, and the other was Diana Brainerd, a former trainee who had just come, uh, who was the director of um, emerging pathogen research at Gilead. Uh, the student was getting text messages from her family saying, oh my God, what's happening here is unbelievable. And Diana was getting requests for a drug that they had developed for Ebola called remdesivir and whether they could use that so um, it became clear to me very early on that something with uh, pandemic potential seemed to be happening in China. We had formed the Reagan Institute to harness the immune system to prevent and cure disease, focusing on infectious pathogens. So we decided that we would uh, immediately pivot to start working on this. We had a vaccine that Dan Baruch, one of the founding members of the Reagan, had developed uh, that was already in clinical efficacy trials for HIV. And so we thought that that platform could actually be applied. And it was through philanthropic funds that we were able to uh, immediately get started. Um, the virus that, um, that causes SARS is a beta coronavirus, um, uh, similar to other coronaviruses, but with a, uh, a, a very high um, in, uh, transmissibility rate. Um, I want to introduce some, uh, a couple of concepts here um, in terms of our understanding about vaccines. So if one gets infected, uh, basically what happens is that the body starts to make immune responses, for example, antibodies. And these antibodies then hopefully clear the infection and leave you with immunity. Um, the problem with SARS-CoV-2 is that the virus itself causes immune damage, immune system damage. So even as the virus is being cleared, you're left with a, a immune response that's sort of trying to develop in this context. So you get what seem to be weakened antibody responses. Basic concept behind creating a vaccine is not to give the entire virus, but to give a portion of the virus, for example, the spike protein, which is the target of these antibodies that develop uh, in natural infection. And when one does that and immunizes uh, an individual, antibodies get generated and now one gets immunity without ever having seen the virus. And the result of that, we hope, is that because there was an immune system damage, that you'll get more longer lived antibody responses and that that will actually ultimately, if enough people get, it, um, get vaccinated, lead to herd immunity. So there are a number of different approaches that are being pursued to develop uh, COVID-19 vaccines, um, from genetic vaccines to inactivated vectors to viral protein such as the spike protein along with an adjuvant, which is sort of an immune booster, and even an activated uh, uh, SARS uh, coronavirus that, uh, that uh, would elicit an immune response. Um, we um, at, the, at the Reagan Institute through Dan uh, got started working on an inactivated viral vector, AD26 um, adenovirus, and um, the, the speed with which that has gone has been really just remarkable. So by January 10th, the virus sequence had been released. By the 13th, uh, Dan had already ordered synthetic genes and fast forward, we're now in phase three efficacy trials, something uh, that nobody thought could happen uh, with the speed that, uh, that this has developed. So there are now a number of different vaccines that are in um, 
uh, in various stages of, uh, of efficacy trials. There's the, there are uh, genetic vaccines, Moderna and BioNTech are the ones that are uh, the, the lead candidates here. Um, these are messenger RNA and Lindsay will speak more about these. Um, AstraZeneca and Janssen are both the pharmaceutical sponsors that are taking uh, in the, on the one hand, a chimp adenovirus vector for work. The reason for a chimp adenovirus vector is that humans will not have seen that previously, so that their immunity to the vector will be less, and so hopefully you can get more immunity to the insert, the genetic insert that's going to produce the spike protein in, in uh, the vaccine. Janssen is using Dan's at 26 vector which is also one that, uh, that uh, very few people have pre-existing immunity to. Um, protein plus adjuvant, these are the vaccines that have the most um, uh, experience, we have the most experience with over the years. Novavax and Sanofi are both uh, developing um, uh, protein-based uh, vaccines uh, that we are a little bit further behind, but may be more palatable to people because of the longer history of use. And then not in the US, but in China, an inactivated virus uh, is, in, um, is in development. So there, these are, I think all of us hope that as many of these as possible will actually be developed because we need to ultimately immunize 7 billion people. And it's gonna be a challenge for any of these alone uh, to get to that point. But as we have different vaccines being developed, there are a number of key questions. Does the vaccine protect from infection or does it protect from disease? Um, ideally, we'd like to fully protect from infection, but if you could protect somebody such that their viral load was very low and they didn't, um, um, and they had less ability to transmit, that would be an effective vaccine. Uh, another big question is, do they protect from severe or only mild infection? Uh, the trials have been changed slightly to make sure that, that we're checking to make sure that they, they actually do have some impact on more severe disease. How many doses are needed? Well, if it's 7 billion people in the world and you need two doses, then you need 14 billion doses versus a, a single dose uh, vaccine, which would be half as much. Um, will there be enough new infections to show protection? I think that is uh, sadly not a problem uh, there, but it will have to be tested in places where there is sufficient ongoing transmission. How soon can a vaccine be widely available? There's a very different question is when will we have a vaccine versus when will one be widely available? And I think Lindsay will probably come back to speaking about that more. Um, Age is a big issue. Uh, vaccines tend to work less well in older individuals, yet those are the ones that are most uh, um, at risk. A cold chain is another major problem, for, particularly for the mRNA vaccines, or major potential problem uh, because of the, the need to maintain the vaccine at a, 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 a low temperature. Durability, obviously, um, and safety are also issues. And then what about children? Vaccines for children are, are actually likely to follow the development of, a, of an adult vaccine, and um, we're not there yet. Um, I, I also want to just mention passive immunization is another way to do this, where you take monoclonal antibodies and give them to people. This is what um, uh, President Trump received, and that is basically a way of circumventing immunization itself to get to the point of immunity. I want to just uh, alert everybody to the fact that we have an incredible group of uh, uh, individuals that have joined a consortium here uh, in Massachusetts called the Mass Consortium on Pathogen Readiness. Um, we have about 500 scientists and clinicians that are working on this. So there's a huge effort going on here. Um, and uh, people on this call actually are, are, uh, are members of this. Uh, and we're quite optimistic. I want to remind people that the experiment's been done in the hospital, that if you wear masks, uh, it actually works because we did not see massive infection of healthcare workers that adhere to those uh, things. And finally, just some quick conclusions. Viruses are existential threats to humanity. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 causes damage to the immune system, and that's why we believe you get these shorter-lived antibody responses. Vaccine development is progressing at an incredible rate. I think success is likely. This is not 
a rapidly variable virus. And in the meantime, masks and physical distancing work. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker. That um, really sets the stage for our subsequent conversations. And I think all, all those questions are exactly the questions that everyone wants to know. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Alter. Thanks, Ingrid. Okay, so, so um, I'll take it from Bruce and just to go through what it is that we hope that a vaccine will elicit. So, so what Bruce highlighted was this um, hypothesis that if a vaccine can induce antibodies of the right quality, that those antibodies will provide protection from infection, um, theoretically for life. Um, but really the truth of vaccine development is it looks a little bit like this. And the way that we develop vaccines is not very different than the way that Edward Jenner developed the first vaccine more than 200 years ago. So we come up with a hypothesis of a particular antigen that might be most useful and most relevant for providing protection. And we put it into a platform that I'll talk about in just a minute way of delivering the um, antigen to the immune system. And then we put it into this black box that we call the immune system. And we hope that through some magical process, the immune system will learn how to develop the right flavors and qualities of antibodies for life that will lead to the development of a safe and effective vaccine. And so for all those who don't recognize this picture, this was uh, Jonah Salk with the polio vaccine. So, so this is really the state of vaccine development today. And so the issue that we have currently and what the reason we have to do these um, phase three trials and to do so much testing is because we need to understand what it is that these vaccines are inducing and to ensure that those vaccines are inducing the right quality of antibodies that will provide protection from infection. Now, as Bruce mentioned, um, we know from the biology of the SARS coronavirus too um, that the spike antigen is really the most critical antigen because it is required for infection. And so the hypothesis was very clear back in February and that was that vaccines that would elicit immune responses to this spike antigen would be the most protective against infection. Now where you know, my perspective falls into all this is to ask the question very simply is, is spike the right antigen? Are we targeting the right protein? And how do we define exactly what it is that is protective so we can advance and accelerate vaccine development as fast as possible to finally end this pandemic? So I just wanna go over one uh, topic or, or, or two, uh, some terms that keep coming up over and over in the media. And I think these terms are really difficult to understand often. And that is a difference between a vaccine and a vaccine platform. I think it's essential to understand these two concepts. A vaccine, and I took this from the most reliable source I could find on the internet, which is of course we could um, But the idea is that vaccines really represent substances that are used to stimulate an immune response. They're used to stimulate antibodies and other forms of immune responses that are there positioned to respond and control a pathogen. Now a vaccine platform is a little bit different. A vaccine platform is essentially a manufacturing pipeline where you can essentially have a type of process where you can essentially take that vaccine and you can insert different pathogen antigens into it one at a time and keep using that form of delivery um, for the immune system to try to stimulate immunity, let's say to this coronavirus, potentially in a year to influenza, and another year potentially to the respiratory syncytial virus. Essentially, it's a Trojan horse, a way that we can safely and effectively deliver antigens to the immune system in a way that the immune system will recognize that this is foreign and will start to mount immune responses to that new antigen. Now, the beautiful thing about these platforms is that we have a lot of information of how they work, on how they work, and we know that they are safe and effective. And so using these platforms allows us now to build on existing data from other trials and to essentially now ask the question, am I mounting the right immune response to my new target of interest, this new antigen that I have inserted into my platform? Now, there are many platforms out there, as Bruce mentioned, over the last five decades, we have evolved many different strategies to deliver foreign material to the immune system. Each one poised to elicit different qualities of immune responses that may be vitally important for training the immune system to fight a pathogen in just the right way. So um, we have ways of essentially taking entire pathogens and splitting them up and essentially delivering them to the immune system. This is how the flu vaccine works. And by splitting up in a process where we know that the 
pathogen now is completely disrupted and completely um, not infectious, we can deliver those pieces of the pathogen and elicit protective immune responses. And this is what Alan was talking about. Please all go get your flu vaccine because it is a very effective uh, public health intervention. But over the years, we've come up with synthetic approaches, like pro approaches to make recombinant protein antigens that are incredibly safe and we can elicit immune responses uh, against target pathogens. We have ways of making carbohydrates or lipids from pathogens to elicit protective immune responses. We've even made, um, used, developed uh, viral vectors that are safe and innocuous in us in uh, the normal environment. But once we can package in uh, antigen from a target novel pathogen, we can use these Trojan innocuous pathogens to now deliver these novel antigens to the immune system to elicit protective immune responses. Um, and then finally, as we heard, there's a number of nucleic acid-based tools. These are synthetic tools where we can use RNA or DNA, which are very simple to generate, to deliver these to the immune system and have them act as software for our cells that essentially provide the information um, to the immune system to start to express these novel antigens to prime more effective immune responses. And as Bruce mentioned, many Many of the um, strategies that are moving forward into clinical testing um, fall into multiple categories or platforms. And what's important about this is that we have a lot of data to support the use of the platforms. And essentially what we need to understand then is whether or not the specific immune responses elicited by these platforms now for the, for the SARS coronavirus 2 virus are going to be effective against infection. So when you think about the clinical development timeline for a vaccine, we of course know that there is a period of time where we come up with our hypothesis. What is the right antigen? We come up with safe and reproducible ways to essentially make that vaccine. We then go into preclinical testing, essentially in animal models, to define the immunological predictors of protection. So we try to figure out what is the immune system doing when it fights the virus correctly. We then move into phase two and three trials, or phase one and two trials, sorry, where we examine the immunogenicity in humans of that platform that we have selected. And we finally go into phase three where we read out whether or not there was protection and if it was associated with the immune responses we initially hypothesized were key to protective immunity. Now where my group falls into all of this is really in this middle phase where we try to understand what it is that is associated with protection. If we can understand these immunological keys to how the virus is eliminated, then we can pick our platform vaccine faster. So how do we do that? What is it that we're trying to understand? Well, we're trying to figure out what matters for driving immunity. We're trying to understand is that we want to elicit with a vaccine. Right now for the SARS coronavirus 2, we don't really understand that key immunological predictive protector of protection. So what we try to understand in the laboratory is how we can move through the animal model as fast as possible and into humans so we can inform vaccine development. And I wanna put out an idea here, and that is that hypothesis-driven research often can narrow the lens of what we might think might be important for immunity. So if we think it has to be antibodies, we might miss all the other immunological mechanisms that might be important for protection. Conversely, what my laboratory specializes in is this tool called systems biology, where we essentially try to capture everything that the immune system is doing. We try to open up that lens as much as possible so we can try to identify those key signatures that are associated with protective immunity. Now I'm gonna give you examples of how we've used this now to inform vaccine development. So in a study that we did with Dan a couple, uh, couple months ago, well, it feels like a couple years ago, but it was actually just back in March, um, uh, Dan took a group of monkeys, he infected them with the coronavirus, let them sit for about two months and then reinfected them. And we asked the question, did the first infection cause protection in the animals? So did they learn drive an immune response and then protected them from a second exposure to the virus. What I'm showing you here is the level of virus here in the lungs as well as in the upper respiratory tract. And what you can see here is the primary exposure on the left where you see lots of virus that eventually comes down both in the lung and in the nose. At re-challenge, this is really critical, there was almost no virus in the lung. There was some virus in the nose. And what was important is there was zero disease at the time of reinfection, so limited pathology. So what this told us is that reinfection protects the lung, but may not protect the nose. And this is critically important for thinking through what it is that we expect from a vaccine. Is it realistic to expect no virus in the nose, 
That is probably not a realistic expectation, but it is possible to expect that we can develop vaccines that can completely limit infection in the lungs. And that's critically important. We prevent disease. Now, using systems biology, these tools, we try to capture as much information as possible about the immune response to understand what it is that is protective in these animals. So at the time of infection, we can look at the immune response. On the top here, I'm just showing you levels of antibodies of different flavors that are present in the monkeys to the receptor binding domain, which is involved in neutralization. The whole spike antigen, which is our hypothesized target, of protective uh, immunity, or the nucleocapsid antigen, which sits inside the virus and is likely not an important target for antibody needed protection. And the only point I want to make here is that we see responses really to all the antigens, depending on what flavor of antibodies we look at. But if we look at the functions of these antibodies, the ability to recruit complement or phagocytosis or cytotoxicity, all mechanisms that are important for uh, capturing and killing the virus itself, only the spike-specific responses over here in the middle were able to recruit function. So all the other antigens were present, antibodies were being made, but the only ones that had functions that could be relevant for controlling the virus was to the full spike antigen. So we believe that S is really what matters for protection. Luckily, all the vaccines that have begun to move forward are based on the full spike antigen. And just to give you one last tidbit of information about what we learn from looking at these animal models in parallel to running these human trials is we learn about the experimental tools that have to be applied to benchmark whether a vaccine is working. So this is an example where we took that information Dan generated a DNA vaccine, he injected the animals, and then he challenged them. And what he found was dramatic, and that was that in the vaccinated animals, there was very little virus in these um, animals. This is the placebo control animals, and these are the vaccinated animals. Now we can make, through the system's biology, we can do uh, measurements of all different functions of antibodies. And what I'm showing you here is the relationship of these different antibody measurements, including antibody titers, levels of different kinds of antibodies, as well as different functions of antibodies. And the only point I wanna make here is where the boxes are red is where there is a very strong relationship between that antibody parameter or that quality of antibodies and control of the virus. So we can see here that neutralization was critically important, but so were three additional functions, complement deposition, as well as phagocytosis that have all now become vital readouts for vaccine efficacy testing. Now, before I sign off and hand it over to um, Lindsay and Bazola, I wanna make one last point. And that is that here, typically we are only measuring antibodies. Now we know that antibodies are the primary correlative protection for most clinically approved vaccines. But what we've begun to learn, and I'm surprised that Bruce didn't mention this, is that we have many, many more immune cells in our body that fight pathogens. And what we've begun to learn is that not only antibodies, but T cells as well might be working together to fight this infection and many others. And so really what we believe is that using and probing the whole immune system may allow us to ultimately select, understand, and deploy the best vaccine platforms to fight this pathogen. So with that, I will stop and pass it over to the next person. Thank you so much, Dr. Alter. That was really incredible and I think really speaks to both the complexity of vaccine development and how absolutely phenomenal it is that all of these steps have occurred so quickly as Alan originally mentioned and also the role of systems biology in, in uncovering these mysteries as you move forward. So thank you. Um, next I'll pass it over to Dr. Baden. Okay, let me uh, redo that and see if you can see. You see my slides. Uh, not just yet, we saw your screen a second ago. It was there a minute ago. Uh, 
Okay, the old one second, I think I figured it out. There we go. Now we have. Yep. Okay. So um, to build on what's been said already, and I um, agree with uh, the opening remarks of Alan that I think that vaccines and hand washing, I would argue, are the two most powerful inter health interventions we've done in the last uh, uh, century or two, if not beyond. And we take them a bit for granted. Um, and I think that I'm still unclear of the exact mechanisms of protection, uh, even for the uh, smallpox vaccine, other than it was able to eradicate a disease. And so I'm a bit of an empiricist, but I think that the biology that Galit has spoken to is critically important to more rapidly direct us as to which antigens to deliver and how to deliver them in a way that most rapidly give, gives us an immune response we think will be protective. And so what you see on this image is, you know, how do we do this quickly? And as uh, Galit mentioned, Normally, this is a 10 to 15 year process with uh, target identification, uh, pre, you know, uh, sample manufacturing, preclinical testing, iteration, uh, uh, revisiting key experiments, eventually getting to uh, small scale manufacturing into humans for early trials, reassessment, retooling, and so on through the critical phase three study, which is the large efficacy trials, which are the data that go to the FDA or to regulatory agencies for approval. And with this are manufacturing processes that can go up to scale. And one of the things that we take for granted is when I prescribe a medication, that medication is manufactured to high resolution specificity. It's not a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It truly is what we want it to be and nothing else. And that's not a trivial undertaking. So what has occurred over the last 10 months is a 10 to 15 year process. We are hoping to telescope to a 10 to 15 month process from target identification, the pathogen that Bruce uh, told us about initially, all the way through efficacy testing, approval and positioning for large scale manufacturing which is billions of doses, hopefully. And this here is, uh, Nikki wrote this for us in the New England Journal, and I play a role there in editing. And she sort of helped frame how we have telescoped this process, because we need to. But we have not short-circuited safety, and I think that's a critically important issue. There's more of a financial risk as to how do we make the investment to move things quickly and to do things simultaneously rather than in series, particularly on the manufacturing side. So Bruce alluded to the different concepts uh, that are being looked at in advanced testing. I'm gonna focus on the mRNA because that is the uh, quickest one to get out of the starting gate and is in the most advanced testing. But these concepts that I'll share with you go for all of the constructs that are moving rapidly to pivotal efficacy testing and hopefully will demonstrate efficacy. What this image uh, demonstrates is the, or shows is that one of the considerations that I think we need to think about as we think about uh, nucleic acid technology, a vector delivered protein inactivated whole virus, what are the implications on manufacturing? So how quickly can you move into uh, target identification target manufacturing or at least construct creation to do the preclinical testing and to develop the manufacturing processes that can go to scale. And nucleic acid-based technologies actually are relatively simple in the design because you need to know the sequence. Once you know the sequence, that is pro programmable into the bioreactor or the uh, construct creation process 
And in fact, the mRNA technologies are positioned to have a half billion to a billion doses available uh, in calendar year 2021 and can be at higher levels of manufacturing if the investment and the will is there to do that. And I think that's an important consideration if one is in the business of delivering a product globally versus trying to understand the biology, which is critically important, but is a different problem to solve. So this cartoon is just showing a little bit about the mRNA technology with the lipid nanoparticle delivering uh, uh, to the presenting cells, macrophages, which do antigen processing and are part of the gatekeepers that deliver immunogens to the key immune cells that Galit talked about, uh, both the B cell, which is the antibody side, the T cell, which is the longer lived memory and leads, you know, the CD4s and CD8s that do more of the hand to hand engagement of infected cells. But this is how do you rapidly deliver an immunogen of interest to the immune system most efficiently? And that's what the different technologies, be they protein, viral vector, or nucleic acid, are trying to do is get the payload to the immune system. And then once the antigen presenting cell uh, receives the payload, then it can uh, lead to protein uh, creation, expression, presentation, immune activation. And what uh, to deliver, um, one needs to think about. In this case, the spike protein seems to be an important uh, immune target and is what's being delivered largely by the advanced constructs in the field. So, um, there are also social aspects to this, or not necessarily social, but scientific aspects that engage uh, broader parts of our community. And how do we do this? And we need to change our thinking a bit. Industry is not evil. Academia is not pure. Um, the government is not a independent broker. We all have different vested interests but we all need to come together, work together to most efficiently develop the science that helps us understand the biology and how best to have a effective vaccine. What the COVID or uh, Prevention Network, which is what uh, the NIH has brought together, NIAID, National Institutes of Allergy, Immunology, Infectious Disease, brought together its groups of investigators and harmonized approaches for efficacy trials, engaging industry who have the ability to manufacture to scale. If we develop something but are not able to deliver it, how successful will we be? And to manufacture billions of doses and deliver billions of doses requires partners across all domains. But in order to do these studies well, we can have different conceptual platforms of constructs that we want to study. We need to harmonize how to study them, have the networks to be able to study them, understand the immune responses elicited and the endpoints have uh, overarching safety that can monitor and biostatistical techniques that allow us to interpret the data in a uniform framework to determine efficacy. So when designing these larger scale human trials, one needs to think carefully about who should we study. You know, obviously it needs to be those of us at risk for acquiring the infection. If you don't get an infection, there's no way to prevent it. But then there are those of us who are at higher risk of complications. Uh, those older than 65, it really is a continuous, not a dichotomous uh, age. Those who have pre-existing medical conditions, but as Bruce discussed, what do we want to actually prevent? Do we want to prevent me from acquiring SARS-CoV-2 or getting sick from SARS-CoV-2? Both are laudable, both are important, both I would love to achieve, but are they both equal? And so one could imagine if this is turned into the common cold, would that be an acceptable outcome versus one never gets it? And I'm not sure that with any of our vaccines, we have lifelong sterilizing immunity, but rather as we've seen with mumps and measles outbreaks is that once we stop community transmission and boosting through the decades of our lives, we may reacquire it, boost our immune system as if we're getting vaccinated, never get sick, but of transient colonization, if you can use that concept for a vaccine, and it leads to, it leads to boosting asymptomatically 
which is likely what goes on with our immune system through time. And then what populations do we care about when we say something works? Is it anyone who received the vaccine? Is it only people who have received the vaccine and likely to have the immune response, meaning they got both shots, in this case, two shots for the mRNA, and they've had enough time for the immune response? So is it day zero? Or if it's a, a zero one month vaccination series, is it day 42? And these are uh, granular details, but it speaks to the complexity of how do we assess efficacy and efficacy to allow us to have the conversation about what works and what works for uh, uh, in whom for which outcome. So there are two uh, mRNA vaccines in the field. These were the first two to get out of the starting gate for phase three trials, Pfizer uh, and Moderna. They both had the spike protein delivered with the mRNA technology. Um, and those are the NCT numbers for those who like to read uh, more detail. What I wanted to show on this slide, which is similar to what uh, Bruce showed with Dan's uh, work with the Ad26, is how quickly we as a community have um, responded. And from the sequence being known in early January, the pathogen identified to the first in human assessment, which was two months, to larger agency grants to fund the larger scale manufacturing, not only for the early stage human assessment, but also if it works, how do you go to scale? Because one needs to build the manufacturing capability at the same time, realizing some of these constructs may not work, but if they do, we'll have saved six months. All the way through to the phase three testing, which began in late July, within a six, seven month period, we went from sequence identification, phase one testing, phase two testing, and initiation of phase three uh, assessment. And then here are how do we decide that we've made the best decisions with phase three testing. And all of this is being done quite rapidly with the phase one data being published in mid-July. And this was uh, Dr. Jackson's study from uh, Seattle. Uh, and here one studies a couple of different doses. How do you know the right dose? How do you know the right regimen? How much time do we want to take to try different permutations? And by studying different doses, can we then see what information on safety and what information on efficacy allows us to trigger the uh, critical phase three or efficacy testing? And here, the 250 microgram dose had more side effects and was not moved forward, but the 25 and the 100 microgram dose showed similar uh, immune responses. And what th this slide shows from Lisa's paper is just that there was more side effects uh, after the second vaccination, a little bit more with the highest dose, but this was modest. If you have an achy arm and feel fluey for a day and you won't get COVID, is that a worthwhile trade-off versus there's no benefit and you shouldn't have any side effects. But that's where we need to know the side effects, even penicillin has side effects. So one needs to know that the benefit of getting this outweighs the risk of getting this, and we need to be able to quantify that risk. And then in the right side of this image, it's just showing different immune responses that allows us to say, we elicited the immune responses that in people who got COVID and got over COVID, uh, particularly uh, with the neutralizing antibody, we've exceeded what natural infection induces. And therefore, this is consistent with what we think would be protective. And also, as Galit uh, showed in the, uh, the non-human primate model, similar immune responses that look protective in the preclinical model. And taken together, these data are encouraging, but uh, it, uh, uh, assumptions are being made that we understand the biology well enough that we're able to move forward to efficacy testing based upon these types of par parameters because they make sense and we have to make our best judgments given the science, prior infections, prior vaccines, and prior analogous models. So the, the current uh, uh, phase three study with uh, the mRNA this is the Moderna, the NIH Moderna study. The Pfizer study looks very similar, where one looks at 30,000 individuals, half get vaccine placebo, double blind placebo controlled, two shots. Um, and we want those at high risk for acquisition and at, for complications. And we want the populations to represent those who have been disproportionately. Uh, 
impacted by COVID and have dif disproportionately illness, you know, the severity of illness, because those are key populations to be able to protect. And we need to, the vac we can only say how well the vaccine works in the populations that we study the vaccines in. So if we study it in 100%, 30,000 men, we cannot make comments on women, et cetera. And so therefore it has to represent the nation and in fact, the world. The outcome is really protecting against uh, COVID illness. Um, and then the uh, size of the study is designed in a way to be able to give an answer in six months instead of 12 months. Different assumptions would uh, take longer to have the event rate to be able to demonstrate the efficacy. And then what level of efficacy is 60% efficacy with a lower bound above 30%? That's technical, but saying that it's likely to be protective at a certain level. This here just demonstrates where these studies uh, go on. The, the COVE study, um, uh, which is with the Moderna construct is across the country, particularly in areas where high levels of transmission are going on. And uh, one comment I just wanted to make about as we are now fully enrolling uh, both the Pfizer study and the Moderna study, and these studies are designed in a way where do we wanna wait for an answer when all 151 events occur. So we enroll 30,000 people and then we monitor them to develop uh, until they develop COVID. If they develop COVID, then we see if half our vaccine, half our placebo, no benefit. But if 100 are in placebo and 50 are in vaccine, then there's a twofold benefit. But do we want to wait till all 151 events occur? Or can we look at it early? And these are called interim analyses. There's a lot of discussion going on about this uh, in the community. Because if there is, let's say, in the first 53 events, one in the vaccine group and 52 in the placebo group, would you want to stop the study because it shows efficacy and we don't want to wait to provide the benefit to the community? Remember, if that occurs, then we also only know safety for you know, uh, you know, two months because the study started end of July. On the other hand, if the efficacy is very potent, do we really want to wait six more months to understand that? However, one needs to realize that at the interim analysis, when a certain number of cases occur, that there's actually a very small chance that it'll show benefit because the way in which the statistics are designed is that there's a very high bar to show benefit early in the study when you've not fully enrolled it. So that the likelihood is that well, the study will go as designed to full completion rather than stop early for efficacy. But the point that I wanted to make is that as these studies go on, if a high level of efficacy is seen, don't we want to act on that as a community, but then we have to decide what that means and how much safety do we have to weigh into our decision-making about how to deploy this. So I'd like to just conclude by saying that the uh, efficiency of developing vaccines in the last 10 months has done 10 years of work in 10 months. And that, as Alan said in the beginning, we as a community will need to take a good hard look at as to what did we do right that should accelerate the other treatments that we want to develop. What can we do better to make sure we enhance safety and proper oversight? By doing things across platforms in a harmonized way, it allows facilitation of enhancing the designs, engaging the community, and developing lots of concepts so we have the best chance of finding something that works is at the heart of this. So thank you for your attention, and I'd like to pass it to Basola, who will talk quite a bit about how we really engage the community, which is such an important part of this activity. Thank you so much, Dr. Baden. And really to bring us through that whole course from the multitude of factors that lead to vaccine development all the way through to the critical elements of delivery. So we're really excited to hear now from Dr. Ojikutu. Great. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Here's the biosocial aspect of today's session that Dr. Brandt referred to earlier. I'm, I'm going to talk about health equity and some of the many challenges to future COVID-19 vaccine uptake, particularly in communities of color, though many of the considerations that I mentioned are going to apply across populations. So as you're all aware, COVID-19 has obviously had a devastating impact on our country and beyond. As of yesterday, there were approximately 7.4 million cases and more than 200,000 deaths. 
you know, one of the striking aspects of this um, epidemic has been the racial and ethnic disparities, both in incidence as well as in hospitalization or severity of disease as well as in death. And um, if you just look at uh, case rates, Black individuals, Latinx individuals, and Indigenous populations or Native American populations have a case rate that's 2.6 and 2.8 times higher than their white counterparts. And Black individuals have a death rate that's more than twice as high as, as white individuals. So I think that probably one of the key questions here, and I know Bruce gave us a list of questions in, in, during his talk, but one of the key, key questions is, if we develop a vaccine, who is actually going to take it? I mean, if, if we're investing a lot into this process, both financially and from a research and intellectual standpoint, but it's really gonna be for naught if we don't have people who are actually willing to take it. Um, I think uh, here I'm going to show you a little bit of data in regards to what we think um, anticipated acceptability will be of that vaccine. This data was collected back in May, uh, so about five months ago. It was a random sample of a thousand individuals who were asked if a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 became available, do you plan to get vaccinated? And unfortunately, the results were quite concerning. So overall, less than 50% of individuals uh, would be willing to take a vaccine. And there was a significant difference by race and ethnicity. So 56% of white individuals, 37% of Latinx, and a mere 25% of black individuals would be willing to take a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Unfortunately, a, a very recent uh, Pew Research Institute poll analyzed similar data comparing May to September in a different sample of individuals, but you know, a, and also a, a probability sample or a random sample. And what they found was that actually this acceptability is going down. So even fewer individuals um, right now are really willing to take this, this vaccine where so much investment has um, gone into development. So these data are concerning, but they're not really surprising per se, it's particularly for those of us who do equity research. Uh, low vaccine uptake, uptake is not a new challenge at all. Um, suboptimal uptake has been noted in regards to many routine, well-established adult um, uh, vaccines. For example, in the 2018-2019 influenza season, which I'm showing you here, approximately one half of white individuals compared to 39 and 30% 30 of black and Latinx individuals uh, respectively reported vaccination. You know, the disparities are more profound in other vaccinations, uh, particularly pneumococcal vaccination, which is recommended for individuals over the age of 65, approximately 73% of white individuals versus 57 and 51% of Latinx individuals uh, reported vaccination in recent years. I think that what's really important here in order to address these disparities and develop some interventions and in, engage communities is to really understand why these barriers exist and, and what is it that's um, the problem? You know, how do, we, how do we figure out what it is that we need to do to increase uptake of these very important vaccines? And so vaccine hesitancy is the concept underlying refusal of vaccination or delay of vaccination. And it's actually, you know, much more complex and a context specific topic um, than you may think. Um, it actually varies widely across individuals and vaccines, but really it can be broken down in, into three components. So there's, there's the value of the actual vaccination. In other words, what do you think your risk is? What's your self-perceived risk? Do you believe the vaccine is necessary? And, um, you know, do you really um, want to take it? You know, there's, so there's, there's, this, there's this issue of value. Next, there's access. So access is about whether or not the, the vaccine is affordable, whether or not it's actually available, whether or not you were actually asked to take it. And then thinking about things in terms of a financial perspective, was there a copay? Is there an opportunity cost? Did you have to work? Do you have to get childcare in order to go and get the vaccine? But lastly, and, and the reason why I sort of made these boxes in, in sort of larger sort of progressive stages is because really the, the big picture here and, and, the, and probably the most potent predictor of, of COVID-19 vac vaccine uptake, particularly in communities of color, would be trust or lack thereof. So mistrust in the actual effectiveness data, the safety data, reliability, mistrust in the competence of our healthcare system, mistrust in government, and really skepticism regarding the motivations of um, our system, our institutions. Institutions. I think that's really the issue that, that's under, underpinning what we're seeing in terms of the data that I showed you. So unfortunately, mistrust um, in healthcare providers, institutions, including clinics, hospitals, as well as our government, as I mentioned, and, and research is really deeply rooted within some communities, particularly the Black or African American community. And it, it inhibits uptake of lots of different interventions. So this isn't just about vaccines, certainly not just about COVID-19 vaccines. And it's really been identified as one of the primary causes of um, racial and ethnic disparities in our country. 
So why is, is mistrust so deeply rooted? You know, I, I'm fairly certain that everyone has, has heard some explanation here. And I think that usually when people try to explain mistrust, uh, particularly um, when you're looking at black populations, but other populations also, they sort of point to historical events, these very egregious historical events, like, you know, you're seeing a picture of um, J. Marion Sims, sort of this father of, of gynecology, who did a lot of um, vesicle vaginal um, uh, uh, repair research in enslaved black women, uh, not using anesthesia and not using informed consent. And then certainly those of us um, who pay attention, you know, have heard about, um, you know, Henrietta Lacks and, and HeLa cells. And then there's the Tuskegee syphilis um, study, which is often um, discussed. And, and certainly in other populations, as I mentioned, so Puerto Rican women, there um, was, particularly during the 50s and 60s, a lot of um, contraceptive research studies not using informed consent that um, they were involved in, um, that one could go back and then question what, what the purpose of targeting that specific population was really about. So as I said, it, it, oftentimes it is about people pointing at these egregious event, events that have really been going on for centuries, which I think is important. But what I'd like to do is sort of bring it to another level, because it's not just about individual events. It's not even about a series of events. It's really about baseline inequity within our system. You know, if you really look at systemic inequity, particularly in healthcare, structural racism within our systems beyond healthcare, um, and you think about, you know, limited access, you think about, um, you know, the discrimination and the racism that occurs, the anti-immigrant sentiment within our healthcare system, certainly limited access to high quality healthcare, longer wait times for specialty care, the emergency department, more illness, worse outcomes, um, premature death, all of which is related to what's happening and, and, and the efforts and the interventions that are supposed to be promoted by, you know, systems that we that are really designed to protect. It's really, it really makes sense that, that people don't trust our systems. And actually, you know, it, it's kind of a, a normal reaction to um, living in the world that we, that we live in, not to trust systems. Okay, so then herein lies the dilemma, because now we, we had this pandemic, I gave you some, some preliminary data, which I'm sure you've you know, seen before in terms of the numbers of people who've been affected. And we've made this huge financial investment. Um, you, know, I, um, you, know, you probably know Operation Warp Speed, we're talking about more than $10 billion. We're talking about all the money that's been put forth in terms of manufacturing and distri distributing and all the things that Dr. Baden spoke about. And then there's this huge intellectual uh, research investment that you've heard about from um, all three of the, uh, the other speakers and certainly ongoing transmission, uh, morbidity and mortality. If you think about it, all of this is really going to be for naught <laughs> if we cannot get people to take this vaccine. So, so what do we do about that? And quite frankly, you know, the honest answer is that, um, you know, your answer and your thoughts are just as good as anybody's, quite frankly, because mistrust, as, as I stated, is deeply rooted. It's been going on for a long time, and it's clearly something that, you know, hasn't been well addressed within our systems. But if you think about some of the things that we're, think, that we're doing now or thinking about, and, um, you know, Dr. Baden's team is working on, you know, a lot of people are focused in on, on outreach. Now, outreach is basically, you know, going out into communities, recruiting sort of trusted messengers, talking to people at the, you know, the historically black colleges, the Latino and Native American serving institutions, the faith-based, um, you know, leadership and getting them engaged, doing vaccine education and this sort of stuff. And outre outreach tends to be a short-term sort of um, sort of operation. You know, even these initiatives, you've probably seen them if you, you know, on Facebook or something, you know, they've recruited some, you know, media personalities. It, it, it's it's a, almost a, a one-off thing in a sense, okay? Okay, and some people may, may disagree with me, but that, that's, really, that's really what it is. It's, it's to get to a final goal. And clearly we're in the middle of a pandemic and maybe getting to a, a final goal, that that's really all that we should hope for. But the reality is that we need something deeper. And I'll talk about that in a second, but what I, what I will say is that I know that you know, people have worked on workforce diversity and sort of increasing the number of particularly black African-American doctors who are involved in this process, um, who are speaking about this you know, you know, across the country. A lot of black organizations are, are working on these issues. Being transparent, um, transparency is really the root of, um, of, of trust, you know, knowing the safety and efficacy data and knowing how that applies to your um, particular population, to people who look like you, really addressing health inequity and structural racism. I mean, these are really key issues that if you really want to, you know, sort of uh, chip away and mistrust, you're going to need to dig in and, and actually do something about these things that have been longstanding and it seemed to have been sort of tolerated within, within our system in that, in that, you know, a concerted large scale effort, uh, you know, hasn't quite been undertaken to, to deal with these issues. But certainly, you know, 
reducing financial barriers to vaccination is, is really important. And I, I know that that's been something that's been discussed. Other issues, I think Dr. Brandt mentioned this issue of a mandate on a federal level. We don't mandate vaccines, but certainly at the state level within schools and employers can certainly you know, try to mandate things. That doesn't necessarily chip away at mistrust. So that may not have some sort of long-term lasting effect on our systems or on health, health inequity or any of these issues. But certainly it may, it may increase the numbers that I, that I showed you. Compensating people. I mean, a lot of people have talked about this. You know, wh why not just give every everybody a, a vaccine stimulus, give everybody a thousand dollars if they go and get, get their COVID-19 vaccine. Again, doesn't really do much in terms of trust, but you know, maybe it'll increase uptake and maybe that's a short-term solution. But what about participation in clinical trials? You know, what does that have to do with all of this? So I, I think that Diversity and participation in clinical trials is important. I'm not a clinical trialist per se, but I, I certainly think that equity across all systems is, is relevant. And certainly you want to be able to have research findings that are generalizable. You want to be able to do subgroup analyses. And this idea that I think we sometimes overlook when we think about who participates in clinical trials is it's really diffusion of innovation. So you have you know, new concepts, new ideas. They just don't get to certain people. How do you get them to certain people? Well, you, you get a few of those people to participate. You get them at the table, you make them participants, and you hopefully um, that, that, um, that health literacy, that, um, that information spreads to their networks and then beyond. But then maybe clinical trial participation actually increases trust. And maybe at the end of the day, it'll, it'll lead to increased uptake. And people have been sort of throwing this around. Maybe, maybe, it, maybe it will, maybe, maybe it won't. In talking to some of the COVID-19 vaccine trial participants who are of color, certainly they've talked about the fact that they, they feel better. They, they're talking to doctors. Some of those doctors, you know, or variety of, you know, race, ethnicities, you know, whatever, but they're getting information and they, they feel better about the situation. And they're, they're sort of transferring that feeling, that um, that, that feeling of, 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 of trust, you know, or something close to it is sort of being spread within at least a limited network of individuals. So it is important. So, you know, diversity in clinical trials, certainly it, it's better science and, and it's certainly a, a social justice um, in Imperative. So going back to this dilemma, um, you know, the reality is, again, we, we've made this huge financial investment. I say we because it's a public-private partnership that's doing this. So this, this, this is our vaccine. So this is a sort of a collective good in a sense. Though, so, though, you know, pharmaceutical companies um, are, are seeing a lot of that money in, ter in terms of the R and D and, and getting things up and up and going. And certainly, the intellectual piece and the, the research investment is important. But if you really want to get at uptake, if you really want to make a long-term lasting change, I think we need to alter what we're doing fundamentally. You know, we talk about community outreach, but community outreach isn't enough. These short-term engagement sort of things where we reach out to people. What we need is community engagement and actual community investment. What we need is to funnel some of the money, a lot of the money that, you know, is going into these sort of development of a public good, a collective good, back into the communities that are most impacted. What that might actually look like, I, I don't know yet. I'm thinking about it, but not, not quite sure. But I think we need to, we need to think more long-term. This is not going anywhere. We have we have time to plan to think. Yes, we're in an emergency, and yes, we have to do the, the short term steps. But really, a longer term plan, I think, I think needs to be um, needs to be articulated. So I'm going to stop there, and um, you know, I guess we're going to go go to questions. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ojikudu. That was really a fantastic presentation. I think we've we've been to sort of how do you get you know, these vaccines into the body to thinking about the body in its social and um, cultural domain. And that's one of the things that just fascinates me about vaccines. I have so many questions, but I'm eager to get some students um, up to ask all of you questions. So Ivan, let's, let's bring some students in.